Uh, today we have uh, Kendall, who's going to be talking about the Drupal 8 mobile initiative and how we can have mobile in our Drupal 8 sites. Uh, I will be uh, proposing the questions that are asked in the general chat. Just please uh, prepend them with questions so I can find them much easier. So welcome everyone to the Drupal 8 mobile initiative presentation. Um, my name is Kendall Totten, and I work for Media Current. I'm the theming manager here. And today we're just going to talk about some of the main points of Drupal 8 and why we need to focus on mobile. Why is it important? Um, we know that there's a lot of overhaul happening in Drupal 8 as a whole, um, but today we're going to talk about just the parts that specifically affect mobile devices and why we need to do so. Um, we're going to start with a quote from Dries himself who talks about why mobile browsing is ubiquitous and why it's so important that we need to focus on it. Because, of course, you know, mobile usage has increased a lot over the last few years. Um, and so they've really made it, the, the core maintainers of Drupal have really made it a priority to start focusing on that and making sure that we have the features that we need and the user experience that we need so that not only can users browse a Drupal website with ease um, right from installation from day one, but also you can manage your content as an administrator um, from your mobile device, which is huge. So fortunately, um, our, our Drupal 8 core priorities here, a couple of these are already covered by the web services and core context initiative. Things like making sure that Drupal is able to integrate natively um, into mobile applications. We want to make sure that Drupal supports web services so that our content can not only be read by just a mobile browser, but also we can take, you know, snippets of that content and feed it into native apps when necessary. Um, we also, of course, want to make sure that we're using the proper HTML5 markup so that it's understood not only by native applications, but by screen readers or, you know, tickers across the bottom of a TV, or Google Glasses, or anywhere else that you might want to pass along your content. So like I said, the first two are kind of covered already. So the things that we're going to focus on is specific things like um, the ability to use the administrative forms on mobile devices and making sure that the core themes are responsive right out of the box. And of course, we do want to make sure that the front end performance improves as well, because it's not only about making your site uh, squishy, as we sometimes call it, you know, making sure that it flexes to fit a screen, but also is it fast enough that it's usable on a mobile device? Because the worst thing in the world is trying to use a website where it's super, super slow on your mobile device to the point where you just give up and you go back to your desktop computer, or first world problems, at least they say. So where do we currently stand in Drupal 8? Well, first off, right now, the Drupal 8 core themes are currently responsive. Um, there's definitely still a bit of work going on here to kind of, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's, um, but we've definitely made a lot of headway. This is a screenshot from an actual Drupal 8 local installation. You can see that it is mobile friendly. And so um, the three core themes, let me go back here, the three core themes that are installed with Drupal right out of the box, Arctic, uh, Stark, and Seven, all three of those are already responsive. So that means as soon as you do an installation, it's ready to go, and you can start managing it from your mobile device. All the Drupal 8 uh, themes are designed with mobile approach or mobile first approach in mind, meaning um, that we're going to load our mobile styles first, and then we're going to use media queries to tack on additional styles. And best of all, the administrative toolbar is responsive, and this is huge. Um, this means that the mo the menu can toggle between a horizontal and vertical mode based on the device orientation that it's viewed in. And the mobile initiative has also ensured that all Drupal admin pages are also optimized for mobile. So you can see here, um, this is a screenshot from a mobile device, and it has a really nice menu where you can click on the drop-down links to get to more content items. And then if you were to switch over to a regular desktop viewport size, you'd see that it expands back out to the horizontal menu that we're used to seeing and back again. And actually, let me, let me actually pull up um, my mobile browser here, this is my iOS tester, and you can see live in action. Um, as I expand the menu, this is really cool. Um, this means that you can easily get to nested menu items, and even ones that are nested, you know, two, three items deep. And as soon as you expand a secondary item, um, it closes up any other secondary items above it, so you don't get lost in the menu tree, um, but it's still very easy to navigate. So this is, this is a huge stride forward. Um, next, we're going to talk about breakpoints, um, which if you're familiar with responsive web de design at all, you know that pretty much uh, a lot of what we, what we refer to as responsive design is based on media queries, um, which kind of boil down to breakpoints. We do want to focus on, of course, uh, pixel density as well, um, if it's a retina display, but breakpoints are kind of the bread and butter, making sure that when, that we're asking the browser, how large are you? And at a certain point, 
you know, let's say we hit 300 pixels or 500 pixels, we say, okay, now we're going to add on some more styles because now this is uh, probably a tablet size device. Or when we hit 960 pixels, we're going to assume that it's a desktop size device, so we're going to make the layout flow to that accordingly. So breakpoints are going to be built in. Um, the breakpoints module is going to standardize the use of breakpoints across themes and across modules so that they can reuse breakpoints. Uh, they'll keep track of the height, width, and resolution. So here's an example of a breakpoint file inside of Barctic theme, um, and it's, it's a YAML file. It's kind of like taking over the info file of the theme. So each line in this file um, will define one breakpoint, which consists of a label, lowercase letters, followed by a colon and a valid media query, um, which can include either a min width, a max width, um, or even a pixel density query. So the order of the lines define the order of the breakpoints, um, which you want to go from the narrow breakpoint to the most wide breakpoint. And we also have built-in support for responsive images, uh, which is huge. So this feature is going to be built into Drupal. This is still in the works. This is not yet complete. Um, but we're definitely forward thinking, and we're, we're building the groundwork so that once the HTML5 spec has been completed and they decide on which element we're going to use, we're going to be ready to step forward on that. Um, at the moment, it's still to be announced. Uh, the World Wide Web Consortium uh, Responsive Images Community Group just had a meetup about a week ago. And at this stage in the game, it seems that uh, both the source set and the picture could emerge as winners. There's kind of, there's a lot of options out there as to which is going to be um, the best use case for integrating responsive images. Um, but the interesting thing is that these two options are not mutually exclusive. Um, they both offer some really good advantages and you know one is a little more simple than the other the source that is a little more streamlined whereas picture kind of um, allows us to have more options but you can actually use both of them in conjunction so I'm just going to walk you through that a little bit and show you what the differences are um, the picture elements it's, it's an HTML element which is similar to the HTML5 video tag so it's brand new um, it's going to use media queries to determine which image to load um, and it's very flexible so this solution is cool because it allows you to bundle together multiple versions of an image. Um, the user agent in the browser can select the optimum image to be presented while providing the best solution for art direction. So this is really cool because it, it means that we're not just taking one image and scaling it down or blowing it up. Um, we can actually load totally different images because you can see, you know, sometimes if you're loading a regular image, um, in an environment where it wasn't exactly expected, like maybe you're, you're looking at a Kindle and it doesn't have color, um, this could be very problematic. You don't want to just take the same image and have the Kindle change it over to monochrome for you because you can't actually read things like a pie chart where color is really important. So when we're using this picture element, um, we can go beyond just viewport size. We can also use criteria like format, resolution, uh, device orientation, you know, monochromatic versus color, and more than that. Um, and so it's also backwards compatible with legacy user agents because it can degrade gracefully uh, through fallback content, basically meaning we can still include a regular image source tag just like we've always done so that older browsers can still read that one just like they've always done, uh, but the newer browsers can see this picture element and interpret that data accordingly. Uh, the next option is the source set, which is an image tag attribute that um, specifies different URLs to load. So it's very similar to picture. Um, the difference is that it's a little bit more streamlined because we're just focusing on using uh, media queries and we're not, we're not actually loading a whole bunch of different variations of the image, just different sizes. Um, this method avoids multiple resource loads and the associated performance problems uh, when, you're, when you're looking at constrained bandwidth environments like mobile devices. So here's an example of, like I said, you can use both of these together. You can see that the picture element is actually like the container that we're loading all of these different media queries and images inside of. Um, and so here we're kind of saying, first we're going to load this, this first image here, this source. I'm going to load a large one JPEG. And I'm going to load that in you know, a regular pixel density environment. Or if I have a retina display, I'm going to load a large 2 JPEG. And that's if my media query says that my browser is at least 45 ms wide, right? So I've got these two images for my large browser space for either pixel, you know, retina displays or regular displays. And then we kind of go downwards from there. Um, if it's a smaller display, we're going to load the medium image. If it's a really small display, so probably a smartphone, we're going to load the smallest image. And then, of course, here's that backwards compatibility that we talked about. So using just the regular image source, just for, you know, IE 7 or 8, 
Um, we're going to load the regular JPEG and, of course, the alt text. And then here we have some accessibility text, too, which is huge because not everybody can, of course, see the images altogether. So this is a really nice um, bundle of all this really valuable data for many different kinds of environments. Um, this is a little bit more complex, though, for loading just one image. So right now, it's unclear which one of these methods we're going to be going forward with. So we're kind of building Drupal 8 with the forward-thinking mentality of maybe using one or both. Um, we're also focusing on improved CSS standards, which is huge. Um, if we're talking about mobile, we want to make sure that we're only loading the CSS that we need and that it's as performant as possible. So uh, the core team has gone through, or the core mobile team has gone through and defined some new CSS formatting guidelines and redesigned the CSS architecture, which is based on SMACs. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, we're also reorganizing the entire CSS file structure with a little bit more logical structuring um, because there's, there's been a lot of talk in recent years ever since the emergence of things like SAS and LESS where we're really critically thinking about how our CSS is organized and it's not just a, well, I like to do it this way and you like to do it that way and you know it's okay for everybody to kind of do their own thing. It's let's make this really systematic and organized um, so that everybody can read the file and know where things are found and the naming conventions are systematic and easy to understand um, and so that way everybody can easily update CSS as needed. So the CSS architecture, let's talk about that first. Uh, we want to make sure our CSS is very predictable so that people that are coming into the CSS and looking at it and trying to make overrides are able to do so very easily. Um, you're not finding unexpected um, long strings of selectors that are harder to override, uh, things like that. We also want to make sure that our CSS is very dry, which means do not repeat yourself. Um, so it's it's reusable chunks of content. So you know, making sure that things aren't named uh, to such a specific level that you can't reuse it when necessary. You want to use generic naming conventions um, that are not not necessarily based on the CSS itself. So we're not going to name things like header blue uh, because that could change on a per theme basis. But we want to make sure it's it's kind of specific to where it's at on the page and and the context that it's in uh, more than the content or the specific styles. Uh, we also want the CSS to be as maintainable as possible and highly scalable. Uh, CSS rules should be abstract and decoupled enough that you can build new components quickly from the existing parts you have without having to recode everything and resolve the same problems. Um, the next CSS architecture formatting is talking about uh, the SMACS module of how we're going to organize things. So there's five rules here when you're trying to when you're talking about CSS styles and you want to divide it up into these categories. You have your base CSS, your layout CSS, your components, uh, which if you're looking at the SMACS um, documentation or book, it's actually referred to as a module in SMACS, but we're changing the naming convention a little bit so as not to confuse people because, of course, we already use the name module in Drupal, so we're calling these little pieces components. Um, and that could be anything that you see like floating around your site, like things that appear in sidebars or footers on these little chunks of code, and or things like you know, a search box even that can be a component. Um, the state of that component, so is it active or inactive, is it you know, hover state or focused, and then the theme itself. And then of course we have, um, if any of you are familiar with Morton, he's been pitching the, it's, he's been calling it BAT for years, where basically if you're a module maintainer and you're writing CSS so that your module is usable both from the admin interface and also once it's implemented, maybe something like nice menus, you, know, you need some basic CSS to begin with, he would always suggested taking your CSS and breaking it up into three separate files, uh, base, admin, and theme. Or in this case, we're changing it to be called modules, admin, and theme. Um, so module maintainers need to be aware of this and make sure that they're following these set of guidelines. So that way, if you're a themer and you're coming in to override some of this stuff, you can easily disable the style sheets that you don't need. So I might want to keep the admin interface style sheet uh, but I might want to disable the regular module and theme style sheet so that I can over, override it uh, much more easily. I don't have to override all those ex existing styles. I can just simply write my own. Um, so this sort of method and kind of making sure that we have everything outlined is, is going to make it easier for people that are coming in writing modules, that are writing new themes, that are beginners and don't know where to start. You know, this is a systematic approach. So this is really excellent. And what about SAS, our favorite CSS um, compiler or preprocessor? So SAS is not going to be a part of Core, although there was much discussion talking about it. Um, but the cool thing is that we're including something in Core called Aesthetic, which is part of 
uh, symphony. So with Aesthetic, you can manipulate assets however you want. Uh, you can load them from anywhere before serving them. So this means we can minify and combine our CSS and JavaScript. We can run the CSS or JavaScript through a compiler like Less or SAS or CoffeeScript. Um, and we can also run image optimizations. So this is going to make it easy for people who want to use SAS um, in their modules or in the theme, very easy to do so. And yeah, actually, Damien brought up a good, good point. We didn't want to add a Ruby dependency um, because SAS does run on Ruby. Um, there are some ways to compile it using PHP. There's a SASE module out there. Uh, but ultimately, you know, SAS, SAS is like the hot new thing right now. And I'm all for it. I give it two thumbs up. But we don't know that, you know, three years from now, there's not going to be something else that's even better than SAS. And so we don't want to put something into core that, you know, we're kind of locked into for however many years until we get to Drupal 9, right? So Drupal 8 is not even going to be out until sometime next year. So we have to be really forward thinking about this approach. Um, and finally, there's going to be some excellent JavaScript enhancements and front end performance in Drupal 8. Um, you know, this change is going to make possible the use of core JavaScript in the context of the asynchronous module definition by Contrib. Uh, this issue is a big front end enhancement and ensures that JavaScript is loaded where it's necessary. Um, and since D8 is so focused on mobile, it's really critical that we're able to add JavaScript uh, where we need to. And, and we're not just implicitly adding you know, jQuery or, or the Drupal JavaScript to the page where we don't need it. So the success of this initiative is because of a lot of contributors, a lot of people that are putting in a lot of hard work and making sure that you know, the, image, the issues that I just talked about are being attended to, that we're you know, being very forward thinking, we're being systematic about our approaches. And so we've come a long way. There's a lot that's been accomplished, and we're you know, really moving along in Drupal 8. And it's exciting that you know, I could show you something like this, and it's like, hey, Drupal 8 is usable and mobile already right now. Um, and that's huge. So you know, all these contributors make it possible. And so we have a lot to be excited about, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. So um, you can definitely check out the Drupal.org community initiatives page, where we're talking about you know, Drupal core mobile specifically and get involved there and see what issues you can, you know, lend a hand and um, not, even if you don't know how to write code, you can still help, you know, uh, do documentation or double check things, do some user testing, etc. So with that, does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Kendall. Uh, so uh, we have one from Andrew. Yep, the first question is uh, with Aesthetic and SAS, for, you know, custom themes, should we be committing the compiled CSS or should we be committing just the SAS and letting Aesthetic take care of the compiling on whichever you know, server it ends up on? I don't know if that's been uh, totally fleshed out yet. I think that with Drupal core specifically, we're not going to have the SAS files in Drupal core. We're just kind of, Aesthetic gives us the ability to compile the code from modules. So it's a really good question. Um, I think it might depend, I don't know, I think it's still a community decision um, how we want to operate that. But I mean, if I was a module maintainer, I would want to include the SAS files um, so that should people want to, like basically if I want to take your, your module CSS that you've included and I want to modify it in some way, so I'll go back to the nice menus example, it would be much easier for me to start with a SAS file and just kind of go from there, a nicely organized SAS file and, you know, append my, and of course I wouldn't be editing the module directly, I would copy the SAS file into my theme, but I would much prefer to have the SAS come with the module even if it's not being loaded by Drupal itself. Um, so I feel like that would be, I don't know, it's still up for discussion, but if it was up to me as a themer, I would, I would love to have the SAS included in the modules. Yeah, I, I've seen it be uh, definitely uh, debated quite a bit and no answer yet, but I was hoping there was an answer. <laughs> Not that I know it quite yet. Checking to see if there are any other questions. Okay, so no questions. Um, so uh, I guess at this point we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Kendall, for presenting this. Thank you. Okay, thank you.